the the secret of the secret is all about visualizing what you want in life and 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 that might come true so is there a, an instance where you visualize something for yourself or you use it for yourself and something's come true from it when i was a little girl i i always dreamed of being in the movies so that worked um and i have to say i feel grateful every time i'm on set i feel grateful today to to be talking to you and um to have this movie come out right now that is so hopeful and i feel like um we all need to be reminded of that the importance of that especially in the year that we've had and and so many people are struggling right now so yes <laughs> I don't want to freak my wife out, but my wife is Rebecca Romaine, very beautiful actress, model. You can look her up right there on the Yahoo search bar right above you. Um, but I may or may not have carried a photo of her around in my wallet for 10 years before I met her. So see everybody, it works. There you go. <laughs> um, I, really hope, I really hope my wife doesn't see this and get like freaked out by that. Or she'll think Super it's, awkward. you know, one way or the other. <laughs> she'll probably find it a little weird. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I have absolutely many, many times. I, I truly believe in it. I believe in it. And whether it's exactly the secret or you want to say it's prayer or you want to say, you know, what, whatever it is. And I also think that there's a great power in doing it for other people. So mine that is very precise is that... Um, I, for many years, have worked with this woman called Deborah Owen, who's my business manager, who I love deeply, who I, you know, literally, t like, it's like, I'm, I've worked with her since I was 19 years old. And um, we speak almost every day. And she's an advisor to me. And she is somebody who every day will wake up and she'll choose to pray for somebody in her life. Mm -hmm. And she will just pray for good things or good thoughts, or she'll pray for something to come to, to her. And five years ago, she called me and said, I was praying for you. And I had this idea that you need to call Andy Tennant, the director of Sweet Home Alabama, and just check in because he's got something for you. And I was like, okay. So I called him and he said, I actually have this thing, the secret. So she secreted the secret. <laughs> I mean, it's truly like amazingly where I've always been struck by it because it was her positive, you know, kind of energy for somebody else. That's what I always think is quite beautiful about like, and goes to this moment with Bray where when you know katie's character says why are you helping us and he says because i can you know and it's simply because deborah's very much similar where she's just somebody who, who tries to help people because she can because it makes her feel good she doesn't want anything out of it and I, I i i think that there's a magic to that yeah what was it like meeting um rhonda byrne on set she has she she sort of started this initiative and she's uh, she's managed it into a into a major um business and industry w was she inspiring to you I love Rhonda and she was so lovely on set. Um, and she's a beautiful soul. And um, I'm, I'm so happy that we've, we've made this. I think it's amazing that we, we made this about, I guess it's two years ago almost. And we were supposed to release it in April, I think. And, you know, obviously that got pushed, but that you know the timing of it all and it actually is really needed right now I feel like um and it's a movie also that you can watch with your whole family and there's a character that most in there that most people can relate to so um I'm I'm very excited about it you play a single mother in the film. How do you hope that that uh, character inspires single mothers in their own lives? Do you hope they take something away from the lessons your character experiences? Yes, well, I play Miranda. Um, she's a widow. She's a single mom of three kids. And I've met so many incredible um, women who have very, very similar circumstances. And when I was preparing to play her, I talked to uh, some people very close to me who have gone through a lot in their lives just to make sure that um, we created a character who is very realistic, um, that her struggles were um, ones that reflected what what women are, you know, who, who've gone through such pain have, have had to deal with, um, if they were like the correct moments to pick um and I feel like 
look, everybody struggles. Every human being struggles. Um, that's part of life. Um, but it's it's hopefully the um, watching her go through this and having a change of heart and transformation. I hope it's healing for people. Um, I think that that movies have the power to do that. Um, and so I hope that this is, you know, something that people um, can connect to and, and definitely um, the change of heart that Miranda has, I hope it inspires people. You get to play kind of the Obi-Wan Kenobi figure a little bit in this one. You you have the answer that a lot of the other people don't. Did you uh, did you sort of think of him that way at all? The, the Obi-Wan Kenobi type? You know, I, I didn't, it's funny. I worked with um, Liam Neeson on a movie and I, someone, I really loved working with him. The guy was like, he's got an Obi-Wan energy to him. And then somebody reminded me, they're like, he's a Jedi. <laughs> I was like, so, you know, and he is a Jedi. There's something about his energy and life and, you know, not to compare my life or, or the character of Bray's life to Liam Neeson, but we've been through hard things, you know, people have been through very difficult things and, and, you know, death and pain and loss. And like, so the, the battle as a human being is how not to become jaded and, and heartbroken and dark. And I think that's a question that we all face. And, you know, the, the Obi-Wans of the world, the Jedis of the world, they, they seem to know the same questions that this character and the story is asking is that, if you choose to be positive and look for the good and be grateful that it has a tremendous power, um, a real, the, the force, <laughs> you know? The Christian Bale was telling on the 20th anniversary of American Psycho, he said that you had told him at the time that all the cast thought he was terrible in, in the movie. <laughs> and, you sort of that, and then you told him that years later on Ford versus Ferrari. What, what was your, can you sort of fill in your version of, of what happened there behind that story? Well, no, it's, it's true. It's like, we, I, I remember like, first of all, we were shooting and I, and I looked at, it was like the first day for me and Willem Dafoe and we were doing this scene and Christian was doing this thing where he was putting salt on a, on a steak. And I was like, that is the fakest salting of a steak I've ever seen. This guy's terrible. And like Dafoe as well, I guess was looking at uh, Mary Heron. I, I don't want to speak for Dafoe, but he was looking at Mary Heron like, what is he doing? Like, and I, we would discuss it at the cast a little bit like, okay. And then you see the movie and it's, and, and it's typical of Christian Bale being, you know, one of the greatest actors in cinema history, you know, because he's so fearless and he's doing work that is so, um, evolved that like my young actor brain was like that guy's terrible when in reality he was brilliant <laughs> so I, I i both apologized to him but it was it, but i actually think he loved it he loved the idea that we all thought he was a terrible actor <laughs> <laughs> looking askance at the <laughs> But it also gets, it's a little bit of a testament to Christian that he would find it funny you know he's it i i that guy man he's a special he's a special dude <laughs> definitely it's also the 20th anniversary of, of just uh, of one of, of just a great movie. You can count on me, Kenneth Lonergan's film, and then you, you were part of that. Is that is that a film that you still think back on, reflect back on 20 years later? As, as a, as a great movie? You know, without a doubt, it was an early movie for me. It came out of a, a Broadway play that I did, and um, that I had known the director Kenny a little bit and done an off Broadway play of his, and that I you know I really loved him as a writer and. You know, it's amazing to watch the work of Mark Ruffalo so many years later being as high and as it's ever been. And Laura Linney and I had also done another movie earlier. And there's like, you know, it's that's again, not to bring it back to this movie, but one of the beauties and difficulties of this career is that you have these relationships that are intense and you work together for a period of time. And then you might not see someone for like 10 or 20 years, you know, and when you get to reunite with them, there's a real sense um, of, of how you've grown and how you've changed and what you've been through and what you've lost and what, you know, you, you know, all these, so there's a real, really interesting, um, I guess, cyclical element to it that I, I really, I really find, you know, moving actually. And then here, this was one of them because it was the same director as Sweet Home Alabama. It was the same DP as Sweet Home Alabama. There was these weird, I almost had flashbacks making this movie. Well, to that point, what was it like working with Andy now? I mean, were, were, was he a different director? Had he done, what's, what differences did you notice between the two experiences? You know, I would say that he's, he's not a different director because his whole thing was creating an environment on set that was joyful. And at the same time, he's a director in that he is very clear in what he wants and what he's asking for. 
and he creates a good place for you to be free and 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 um, fearless. But at the same time, he kind of challenges you too, which is what I think good directors do. So I didn't. I, what I what I liked about him working with him again is that there was so much water under the bridge. You know that we've both been through a lot since we had made that movie, and that there was a lot of that. I think in many ways we'd both grown up, you know, and not that we particularly Andy was, you know, a little older than me when we made Sweet Home Alabama, but he'd gone off to have this huge, wild, successful career and really heavy ups and downs as I have had, as most people in this business have had. I mean, I think part of it for the world is we all look at, you know, the Leonardo DiCaprio's or the Brad Pitt's of the world who kind of are always on top, but they're, but for the most part, most people really come up and down, you know, and they're, long periods without work and there are long periods without paychecks and then suddenly something is you know very successful and then suddenly it's not <laughs> you know? so that was a conversation that andy and i got to have and and got to relate on and and um and, and i don't know I, I i just genuinely like that man that's awesome and you and now you have two movies opening back to back uh in a week between this and she dies tomorrow so there we go it's, it's an up period again <laughs> Exactly. It comes and goes. And it, with the Am Amy's movie, it was really interesting because I didn't know her at all. I showed up and literally met her the first minute. And because it was a call, like a favor that she asked somebody and it was like, well, Josh can show up. <laughs> and he was like, literally, I like, I, I, I got this phone call and drove to this place in the middle of nowhere and worked with her for two hours and left. And it was like, okay, that was kind of strange and you know, expected nothing. And here this woman makes this fantastic movie out of thin air with no money, you know, talk about talent. Wow. As you mentioned, we are in a difficult time right now. Uh, you were in New York, or you've been in New York while the pandemic was happening. What was it like to be in the city during the, those moments? Did it sort of make you, did it inspire you to be to be there seeing how people were uh, handling the, the, such a difficult time? Yes, well, I've been in and out of the city during the pandemic. And um, I have to say there's been, you know, many different emotions throughout this whole uh, time here as it as it has for people all over um, but it was so inspiring like in the beginning when um, you know New York was just it was 800 deaths a day which was horrible um, and people were volunteering medical workers were coming in from other states um, and then when you were at seven o'clock when people were ringing and clapping and um, doing their pans and it was just like wow and then um you know all of the protests were incredible and important and um so uh clarifying and um i just feel like there's there's been such a transformation of humanity um and um it's been a beautiful thing to witness and be a part of um, because I've been in and out and I um, I feel like people, even though, you know, this is a really hard time, you're seeing the best of people. As, as parents, we're all asking ourselves, how do we handle school coming back? Have you thought about yourself, what you hope happens with, with school and for your daughter, what your, what your plans might be for the fall? You know, I, I, I just want, um, I want everybody to be as safe as possible. I mean, it's a hard one and I, I have no <laughs> uh, expertise on this uh, in terms of, of health measures, but um, I just want to be as, as smart as possible for the whole community and, and to uh, really prevent um, you know, anyone from getting, getting sick because my heart really goes out to all the people who, who've lost people. In a weird bit of kismet, um, you, 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 I've read that you wrote um, Katie Holmes' movie First Daughter uh, back in the day, and now you're appearing with her. Is that a, is that a funny coincidence that you talk about that? I guess that's a laws of attraction thing. You know, it's so funny. I, uh, this is getting really deep. Once again, you got to hit that Yahoo search bar. Um, I wrote a film called First Daughter. I wrote the screenplay. Katie Holmes was the star of it. I had little or nothing to do with the actual production of the film um <laughs> trust me I, I i tried to get on set nobody wanted the writer around um and uh yeah it it, it was really funny that years later i'd be working with katie holmes i do want to say right now 
working with Katie was that woman is the best. Katie's a great mother, beautiful. I don't judge people physically, but Katie is beautiful and uh, just a great mom to boot. I really enjoyed enjoyed working with her. I really did. This blew my mind recently, so I have to ask you about it. Um, in Scream 2, I read that Derek was supposed to be Ghostface originally, and, that, and they had I, to change that. Again, you got to hit that Yahoo search bar. I was in Scream 2, I got to tell you, I think 23 years ago. Has it been that long? It's been that oh, long. Boy. 23 years ago, uh, you know, we never got the ending when we got the Scream 2 script. They gave us everything but the last 10 pages. And then um, uh, we all found out. Uh, do I have to say spoiler alert if it's the 23-year-old movie? So we found out that, uh, you know, the other two people were the killer and not me. And there were rumors. I didn't hear till later that Kevin Williamson and Julie Pleck and Richard Potter, all of our writers and stuff, and Wes Craven, God rest his soul, um, that I was supposed to be one of the killers. It was it was funny. That that would have been fun. But uh, still, I had a pretty epic death scene in Scream 2. Yeah, you're up on the cross there and you get shot in the middle. That, that was a pretty good death scene. Do you remember Do you remember shooting that scene? Do you remember your, your farewell? Of course. Oh, man. Scream 2 was such a good time to, just because it was like, it was like the Hollywood, you know, it's funny. I always, and we all do. I had moved to Los Angeles from New York. I didn't really know anyone. You always feel like you're not invited to parties. You're not with the cool crowd. You, everyone feels that way. Everyone feels that way when they move to a new town and you're yearning for something. But when I got to the set of Scream 2 and Nev Campbell, Leah Shriver, uh, Jamie Kennedy, Jamie Kennedy, Sarah Michelle Geller, uh, Rebecca Gayhart, Portia de Rossi, I mean, it goes on and on and on. I'm sorry, Courtney Cox, David Arquette, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting anybody, but I really felt like I had, there's no cooler place that I could be. I mean, I felt like I had arrived. That was it. It was a really fun time. <laughs> I had read that you sort of won the role when you performed the song, I Think I Love You. You did the big, uh, when you performed that song for the, for the casting, that's what they convinced them to cast you. Yeah, it was a fun scene to do. Uh, I have no musical training at all. Um, I just do karaoke. So I really attacked it like I was drunk and at karaoke. And uh, I guess it worked. <laughs> nice. Have you shown it to your kids or do you plan to? Do you plan to watch with them one day? Um, Scream 2, yeah. Um, the, the one I really want to get my kids to watch is that Stand By Me. It's, um, it's a little tough these days with, uh, you know, my children are 11 and they're on TikTok all the time. So it's tough to get them to sit down for two hours. Although I am very proud of my daughter. I know I'm supposed to be talking about the secret dare to dream. Everybody should download it wherever they can. But um, my daughter read The Hobbit and watched the film. And um very proud of her she really nerded out <laughs> uh, I do have to tell you my daughter did not like how they jumped between three books storylines and stuff it really my daughter felt they should have um stuck closer to the the chronology of the books it's really bothered my daughter um oh yeah um uh, I mean, this is probably going to annoy everyone who's watching this, but um, my daughter felt that there was too much with the battle scenes, that 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 it wasn't all about the battle scenes and that. And I was like, well, it's a movie. They got to put battle scenes in there. And my, my daughter was like, no. And my daughter was also upset that they didn't make a bigger deal out of the eagle. Uh, uh, spoiler alert. Sorry, everybody, if I'm offending, but there's eagles that come in. And my daughter thought they should have been made a bigger deal out of them because they were, had a bigger role in the book. It's true. That's all. That's all. I'm proud of her, though. I was like, I was like, yeah. Take that anger. Take that anger to Twitter. Let them. Know. Right. Let them know. <laughs> that's nerd right there. That's, that's early nerd take right it, there. Yeah. Right. Feel that anger. Harness it, and then throw it back at those Hollywood <laughs> types. Yes. My secret identity was my favorite superhero show for the longest time, and I, I would I would hold the uh, the deodorant cans like Ultraman. Uh, and I even had the novelization at one point. It was it was a really great childhood show. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, it was a kid's show I did called My Secret Identity. I was, uh, I guess I was an early superhero. I mean, I guess I have played a superhero. Um, exactly. 
I, uh, yeah, it was a really fun, fun, cute show. But that, you can go in a deep dive on that. Just, just Yahoo search it. My secret <laughs> identity. You really, you really get into all the hits. I love it.